Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Cormac McCarthy and the kind of medievalism that he engages with, especially in Blood Meridian. See, I read Blood Meridian quite a few times, um, and I am a medievalist, so whenever I read Blood Meridian, I'm always struck by how much medieval imagery and how many medieval illusions are just littered throughout this book. A book which is very much, at least ostensibly, about post-Mexican-American War America. But I think McCarthy uses all of this medieval imagery very effectively to help place the history of America within this much longer literary tradition that goes back to medieval literature. So with Blood Meridian, there is just so much to say, and so much has already been said. So I'm not going to try to make a full and cohesive argument about the book entire or anything like that. Instead, what I want to focus on in this video is three different instances of McCarthy's medievalism. One is the use of Anglo-Saxon imagery, especially in the parts dealing with Captain White's filibuster and the massacre of that filibuster by the, quote, Legion of Horribles. Two is the description of the natural world and how this relates uh, quite explicitly at times to the medieval fairy world that so many medieval romances uh, we're interested in. And number three, and I just want to touch on this one for time's sake, but the many allusions to feudalism uh, throughout this book, which I, I think helped McCarthy explore some of the connections between feudalism and capitalism and help them kind of deconstruct this American epic of uh, American capitalism and American expansionism. First, I think I need to establish what I mean when I say medievalism. Uh, importantly, this idea of medievalism is focused on the reception and perception of the Middle Ages. That is, it has nothing to do with historical accuracy or what the Middle Ages actually were. The study of medievalism is the study of how the Middle Ages were perceived and received and uh, depicted outside of the Middle Ages. That is, think about how the Victorians, for, the, for instance, uh, depicted the Vikings as wearing uh, big horned helmets. They didn't. But this helped the Victorians establish some sort of image of the Vikings that they wanted to establish. Or think about how Game of Thrones uses all of this uh, kind of medieval world uh, that it uses and then embeds it into this fantastical world and mixes fantasy with history. This is all to say that medievalism has nothing to do with historical accuracy. In this video, I'm not talking about uh, what the Middle Ages actually were. I'm talking about how they are perceived and depicted by people outside of the Middle Ages. Medievalism is interested in the stories, the worldviews, and the ideologies that we often, rightly or wrongly, associate with the Middle Ages. Go read some essays by Umberto Eco if you want a little bit more, or watch my video on Dreaming of the Middle Ages, um, where I talk about ideas of medievalism uh, a bit more at length. But McCarthy has a ton of medievalism in Blood Meridian. Perhaps the first moment where it's especially evident is in the section where the kid joins the Cap uh, Captain White's filibuster, who on the very unsteady grounds of manifest destiny, white supremacy, and anti-European ideologies, uh, cross the Rio Grande to attempt to conquer Mexico or something like that. And well, they wake more than the dogs, as the Mennonite warned that they would. And in one of the most famous scenes in the novel, this band is absolutely decimated by this legion of horribles, this uh, Comanche war band who come in and completely decimate uh, Captain White's filibuster. And it's an incredible passage for so many different reasons. But McCarthy seems to be, at least in my reading of the scene, he seems to be alluding um, very directly to the Battle of Hastings and the Norman conquest of England. Bear with me just a second. The Battle of Hastings, uh, October 14th, 1066, King Harold II of England is defeated in a field near Hastings by the soon-to-be-named William the Conqueror, who was the Duke of Normandy. And this is a red-letter date in British history um, and Western civilization history um, because this is the beginning of Norman rule in Britain, which would last for you know, a few hundred years. And Britain becomes something quite different than what it was before 1066. It begins to have many more connections to the continent, French becomes a very important language spoken on the island of Britain, and this is why, of course, we have so many French loanwords, um, and French is such an influence on English. It's because of the Norman Conquest. Old English, the 
Germanic language of Beowulf slowly transitions into what will be called Middle English, which has all of this ro uh, romance influence on it, right? The Old English of Beowulf. Offshilshaving Shetanatoriatu Managu Maigthu Meru Settle of Tiach becomes the Middle English of Chaucer. Juanat April with his Shur Risota, the Drukt of March as Persid to the Rota. So in Blood Meridian, we see the Comanche army approaching. And let me just read the beginning of this scene before the uh, Comanche are described in very, very, uh, uh, in, in much detail of how they're dressed. Already you could see through the dust on the ponies' hides, the painted chevrons, and the hands and the rising suns, and birds and fish of every device, like the shades of old work through s sizing on a canvas. And now too you could hear above the pounding of the unshod hooves, the piping of the quena, flutes made from human bones, and some among the company had begun to, s to saw back on their mounts, and some to mill in confusion, when up from the offside of those ponies there rose a fabled horde of mounted lancers, and archers bearing shields bedight with bits of broken mirror glass, that cast a thousand unpierced suns against the eyes of their enemies. So they're depicted as this fabled horde of mounted lancers, this army up on horseback charging with lances. And one of the reasons why William the Conqueror was so successful in his invasion of England was because his army uh, fought on horseback. The Anglo-Saxons didn't fight on horseback. They fought in what were called shield walls, where they would stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with other men, hold their shields out in front of them, shield to shield, and walk slowly at the opposing army. So battles in Anglo-Saxon Britain were mainly made up of these two shield walls slowly walking into each other and then pressing against each other and stabbing through their shields. Well, how do you very easily break one of these shield walls? Well, you get a bunch of armored dudes on horseback charging full speed at this wall. The line will break pretty easily. And in fact, McCarthy reinforces this illusion just a bit later, after the Comanche have broken the ranks of Captain White's filibuster and the massacre begins. We get in the middle of this, of this again, very long description, this quick reference, some with nightmare faces painted on their breasts, riding down the unhorsed Saxons and spearing and clubbing them and leaping from their mounts with knives and running about on the ground with a peculiar bandy-legged trot, like creatures driven to alien forms of locomotion. So this battle scene is an absolute massacre of the Anglo-Americans, and with it, it's an absolute massacre of the ideologies that created this band, the ideologies of white supremacy and manifest destiny. And I think McCarthy is actually playing with a lot of the um, linguistic connections between uh, what we call the Anglo-Saxons and uh, the Ang white Anglo-Saxon Protestants of this time period, the dominant racial group of the 19th century, these wasps. That is, in this scene, the Anglo-Americans, their whiteness is centered as they're constantly being uh, alluded to as these Saxons, as these Anglo-Saxons, which should be bringing up connections to wasps. McCarthy is often talked about as kind of problematic, especially uh, when it comes to his discussions of race and racism in his novels. And I think there are absolutely fair points to be made with this criticism. Though I think, like I argued in a previous video uh, on Child of God, which I don't recommend you watch, by the way, um, I fully stand by the argument made in that video, but the presentation of that script was perhaps a bit awkward. It was my first video. But what I'm getting at is that McCarthy in Blood Meridian, as in Child of God, I think he's actually very much deconstructing whiteness and thereby deconstructing these uh, myths of manifest destiny and white supremacy that at least the first part of Blood Meridian, when it comes to Captain White's filibuster, that that, that band really stands for. They're the embodiment of these ideologies. I mean, they're led by a guy named Captain White. So McCarthy is, I think, in this scene, using our perception of the downfall of the Anglo-Saxons by the Normans, uh, which, by the way, there's a load of anti-European and specifically anti-French uh, ideas posited by Captain White and continue to be held by both British people and Anglo-Americans to this day. But McCarthy is staging this massacre within the first 60 pages of this book that is often called an American epic. 
He's staging a massacre of this white hegemonic manifest destiny ideology. A lot of people today, as I just kind of noted, still lament the Norman conquest of Britain. And there's a lot of like really weird uh, racial purity arguments uh, kind of circling this idea and a lot of anti-French arguments that, that, that are, are built into this lament of the downfall of the Anglo-Saxons and the rise of Norman Britain. As people often see this as a moment where the Germanic Anglo-Saxons kind of become tainted by these European, uh, European invaders. I mean, again, look at discourses around Brexit and things like that. A lot of this is still relevant today. But by couching this massacre of Captain White's filibuster in the uh, language and imagery of the downfall of the Anglo-Saxon, McCarthy is drawing elusive parallels between uh, our view of, of the history of both Western civilization and the history of whiteness. So this book goes on and the kid joins the Glanton gang who aren't fully interested in the ideas of manifest destiny, of course. I mean, they do expose some of these belief systems in their racism and stuff like that, but they are, they are a wholly different group than Captain White's band. Captain White's ideas of manifest destiny and white supremacy and all this different stuff, they were massacred. The Glanton gang is something wholly different. They just want to hunt scalps and make money. They don't want to conquer Mexico or anything like that. But for the next 200 or so pages, from the recruitment of Toadvine and the kid into the Glanton gang until the Yuma Ferry Massacre, we follow the Glanton gang as they go and complete a series of quests. And I think this quest narrative is actually built into the narrative. This section is, uh, my students often lament anyways, that this student, uh, that, that this section is often very repetitive. As this gang gets a contract to hunt Gomez, and then they just repeatedly start uh, going to random villages and slaughtering the inhabitants over and over and over again. And throughout this section, we get this continual repetition of this phrase, they rode on, they rode on, they rode on as they keep moving throughout this region. That is, this section is set up as a quest narrative in some kind of way. And these quest narratives are so popular in, the, in Middle English and Old French romances, uh, and some old, uh, old Norse romances as well, but we don't need to get into that. But that is, these medieval romances often follow a hero or a band of heroes as they go on a series of quests, often killing monsters and other bad people you know, obtaining legendary swords, pledging fealty to various kings and queens all around the world, all until they finally, at the end, return home with some sort of boon, right? It's very much Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, the so-called monomyth. The problem with Blood Meridian and this quest narrative is, what the hell is the quest? <laughs> what are they actually doing? They aren't searching for the Holy Grail or the uh, earthly paradise, nor are they out killing monsters or anything like that. They're searching for scalps. It's a capitalistic bastardization of the quest narrative that's so prominent in medieval literature. And what's especially interesting for my purposes here uh, it, throughout this section are these long descriptions of the natural world, which again, are repetitive in a lot of ways. But very importantly, the Glanton gang treads across this increasingly alien world throughout this quest or throughout these series of quests. The world transforms as it does, by the way, in medieval travel narratives and medieval romances, sort of the further away from home that our heroes and heroines get in medieval uh, romances and medieval travel narratives, the world becomes increasingly alien, increasingly surreal. And in fact, they often travel in these narratives to these other worlds, often the kind of fairy realm and places like that, which often work as sort of, sort of surreal versions of our own world, that they're vaguely recognizable, but they're, they're not quite our world. And in fact, there, there's, a, there's a really good uh, Cormac McCarthy scholar named Luke William Mills, who just a couple of years ago wrote this essay called American Fairy, uh, Medieval Fairy Lore in Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, which he argues in a really smart paper that I'm very jealous of because I, I wish I, I wrote it first um, when I came across it. Um, but he argues that McCarthy in Blood Meridian is creating an American version of this fairy world that, again, is so prominent in both uh, Middle English, sort of British uh, 
romances as well as old French romances on the continent. So go read that paper. Many of my ideas here are highly informed by Mills's uh, excellent scholarship. And he goes into just way more detail than I can go into here. But let's just look at a couple different moments in the text. There are so many to choose from. It's really hard to pick just a couple. But one of the first times where we fully encounter this other world that is entirely alien and we begin to see glimpses that they're not quite in our world any longer is actually when he first joins Captain White's band and they first cross the Rio Grande into Mexico. And this is actually before the uh, Legion of Horrible scene. And they cross the Rio Grande and ride through this region electric as they witness this storm. And we just get this description I'll just read a small bit of. The thunder moved up from the southwest and lightning lit the desert all around them, blue and barren. Great clanging reaches ordered out of the absolute night like some demon kingdom summoned up or changeling land that come the day would leave them neither trace nor smoke nor ruin more than any troubling dream. This demon kingdom or this changeling land is so interesting because it's almost like our world, but there's something off. There's something surreal about it. It's kind of like uh, like an adventure into the underworld, but more likely it's actually a excursion into an other world. Let me actually just read very quickly a description from the Middle English Sir Orfeo, which is a great little romance. It's very short, it's like a thousand lines, um, but it, it's a, a, a romance that is based clearly on the uh, uh, Greek Orpheo and Eurydice myth. Um, and in this, Sir Orpheo needs to travel to this fairy realm to get back his wife who's been taken by a fairy king. So after uh, Sir Orpheo's wife Eurydice is taken, um, Orpheo is wandering the woods, sort of looking for his wife, but not really. But eventually he sees this large army, this very richly um, uh, arrayed army, bedecked in just rich armor and these beautiful jewels and everything like that. And with this army, he sees his wife, Herodis, and he starts following this large retinue. And eventually they ride into a rock. So Orpheo follows them through this rock. And you know you can note all of the natural world imagery, right? The, the, the other world is always you know, either through a rock or through a mountain. That's usually how you get into this new realm. But let me just read the description of what Orpheo sees when he crosses into the other side, into this other world. And this is in J.R.R. Tolkien's translation. So Orpheo rides into or walks into this rock and he starts and he keeps going, quote, until he came into a country fair as bright as sun in summer air, level and smooth it was and green, a hill nor, nor valley there was to be seen. A castle he saw amid the land, princely and proud and lofty stand. The outer wall around it laid, of shining crystal clear was made. A hundred towers were raised about with cunning wrought and embattled stout. And from the moat, each buttress bold and archers sprang of rich red gold. And this description of this beautiful and richly adorned castle just goes on. And eventually he actually identifies it as um, the court of paradise. And by the way, this description uh, sounds very familiar to some of the mirages that the kid and Sprawl see in chapter five. But what or when Orfeo actually enters the city walls, the castle walls, um, he sees something very different. Then he began to gaze about and saw within the walls a rout of folk that were thither drawn below and mourned as dead, but were not so. For some there stood who had no head, and some no arms, nor feet, some bled, and through their bodies wounds were set, and some were strangled as they ate, and some lay raving, chained and bound, and some in water had been drowned, and some were withered in the fire, and some on horses in war's attire, and wives there lay in their child bed, and mad were some, and some were dead. It's really quite disturbing, and in fact, it always reminds me of the how the natural world in Blood Meridian is described as we're always told about all of these dead bodies that just litter the landscape, both of humans and animals. And we always get these descriptions of these bone white bones jutting out of the earth. That is the natural world in Blood Meridian is filled with just these dead bodies and the earth is holding on to these dead bodies, which is the exact scene that Sir Orfeo finds 
when he rides into this fairy kingdom. And this exploration of the other world continues in Blood Meridian, as the world in which this book takes place is again barely recognizable. It feels a lot closer to the fairy world than it does our world, as the world around them becomes again increasingly hostile and aggressive. And it becomes increasingly unnatural at one point just before the judge's sermon on war. We're told that the Glanton gang, uh, they rode through a region where iron will not rust, nor tin tarnish. But a bit earlier, at the beginning of chapter 12, we get uh, this really long description of the Glanton gang riding through the desert like a patrol condemned to ride out some ancient curse. Which is a, a great line, I love it. But this passage goes on and it says, They rode on. They rode like men invested with a purpose whose origins were antecedent to them, like blood legatees of an order both imperative and remote. For although each man among them was discreet unto himself, conjoined they made a thing that had not been before, and in that communal soul were wastes hardly reckonable more than those whited regions on old maps where monsters do live, and where there is nothing other of, of the known world save conjectural winds. This slight reference to old maps, I think is, is a reference to, I mean, a lot of medieval maps. Uh, most famously, perhaps, the Hereford Map of Mundi can be, as a, can be a stand in for a lot of medieval cartography. And this is a map I've spoken about quite a bit in other videos, so I'll be brief here. But the, if, you look, the, if you look at the map and kind of zoom into different areas, the further you get away from Europe, the more kind of monstrous the world becomes. It becomes increasingly uh, humanoid rather than human. And we begin getting these hybrid beasts and, and stuff like that. And in fact, in Blood Meridian, the further and the longer that the Glanton gang rides, the more monstrous they become. This is also something that happens uh, in Beowulf, or at least in my reading of Beowulf, right? Where Beowulf um, continually fights these monsters and sort of the more he fights them, the more monstrous he becomes, right? It's kind of that Nietzsche quote that it's not something like um, whoever, whoever fights monsters should see to it that they don't, in the process, become a monster themselves. So in these journeys throughout Sonora and Chihuahua, so many towns are described as medieval in various different ways. And again, I can't go through every single example. Um, I promise there's a ton of examples. Um, but this is just one example where they ride past this town and it says, They rode on through sandstone cities in the dusk of that day, past castle and keep, and wind-fashioned watchtower, and stone granaries in sun and in shadow. This is a world very much like the medieval world in which the architecture itself is based on war. Why do castles exist? Well, because armed men exist. And of course, by describing all of these Mexican towns as castles and as keeps and as medieval towns, what McCarthy is actually doing is transferring the medieval story world of Europe and the medieval landscape of Europe and transferring it to the Americas, to Mexico. That is, America doesn't have a Middle Ages in the same way that Europe does, right? The Middle Ages, um, at least in the West and, and how we use that term, refers to the time period in Europe, usually between um, the Roman Empire and the Renaissance, right? The Middle Ages, it's between those two um, events. But by constantly referring to things in this medieval imagery and through these medieval illusions, McCarthy is transplanting the medieval story world, which is full of knights and castles and violence, to America, which is full of scalp hunters, abandoned churches, uh, abandoned churches, and, well, more violence. That is, these two worlds aren't that dissimilar. And by littering the American continent with all of this medieval imagery, McCarthy is, I think, in a way, deconstructing the American epic while also sort of writing one. That is, this book places a lot of American history within a medieval context, which, for better or worse, for the record, I think worse, uh, we often think of the Middle Ages as a more barbaric and brutal age than our own, or than the 19th century. And just for another example, at the Yuma Ferry Massacre, which occurs because of all of this backstabbing and just this whole, this whole mess um, that I think someone could very easily read a sort of uh, uh, capitalistic 
uh, reading of this scene as the reason why the Glanton gang takes over this ferry is to just make money, and then they create this monopoly by killing the other ferries nearby. Um, but it's because of all of this uh, capitalistic uh, desire that the Yuma Ferry Massacre occurs, and, well, most of the people in the band lose their lives. And, well, let's just read the death of John Joel Glanton. When they entered Glanton's chamber, he lurched upright and glared wildly about him. The small clay room he occupied was entirely filled with a brass bed he'd appropriated from some migrating family, and he sat in it like a debauched feudal baron, while his weapons hung in a rich array from the finials. Caballo and Pello mounted into the actual bed with him and stood there while one of the attending tribunal handed him at his right side a common axe, the hickory helve, of which was carved with pagan motifs and tasseled with the feathers of predatory birds. Glanton spat. Hack away, you mean red N, he said, and the old man raised the axe and split the head of John Joel Glanton to the thrapple. To the very end, Glanton holds on to his racist ideologies, the ideologies which created Manifest Destiny in the first place. But it's also what gets him killed, much like uh, how it killed White Jackson earlier in the novel. Glanton is described as a debauched feudal baron, but what drove him to take over the ferry was, in some ways, a capitalistic impulse. But, of course, what drives both of these ideologies, capitalism and feudalism, is the same thing, really, human greed and human cruelty. Capitalism seems to be both everything and nothing. People seem to use capitalism when they simply mean greed, when, spoiler alert, uh, people are greedy also outside of capitalism. But I think what McCarthy is doing by constantly exploring both capitalism in terms of scalp hunting and feudalism in terms of just all of this medieval imagery and by describing Glanton as a debauched feudal baron, McCarthy is showing how these two systems are fundamentally built on the exact same things, strength and power, and the ability for men, specifically, to wield these, both rhetorically and physically. Both of these systems are indebted to the same human phenomenon. Both are based in war, in genocide, and in oppression. That is, for the oppressed in both systems, what exactly are the differences between feudalism and capitalism? Both are systems of oppression where strong men come out on top and stand like some great bald and archimandrite on a mound of corpses. The medieval world is quite close to the world depicted in Blood Meridian, as they're both filled with murderous and monstrous men, which of course proves the judge's argument that war is God. But I think that if we read Blood Meridian and center these medieval illusions, which are, again, almost countless in this book, I think what we see is that McCarthy is kind of consciously adapting the medieval story world for the American world and for American history, and thereby creating a sort of corrupted version of the medieval national epic that so many European countries are so proud of having and that we in America don't have, right? We don't have our Beowulf, or our Song of Roland, or our Brennunial Saga, or our El Cid, or the Nibelungalid, or uh, the Commedia. We don't have any of that. Instead, we have texts like this. But anyways, I think I'll just stop there for now. Um, I do have a lot of thoughts on how uh, Blood Meridian is connected to the kind of medieval genre of the epic um, that I did write down but deleted out of the script because the video is getting too long. Um, but do let me know if that's something you're interested in. I'm also, I also have a lot of uh, thoughts on some of these specific allusions to specific medieval texts. Um, in this book called Books Are Made Out of Books, um, the, who is it, what's his name? Um, Michael Ling Cruz uh, remarks that, that, that uh, Cormac McCarthy did love Beowulf, and there are all these references to Beowulf throughout Blood Meridian and throughout his other works as well. But so I have thoughts on that. But for now, I think I'll leave um, a few different works in the description box below of scholars who are doing some of this work, though I don't think enough work on McCarthy's uh, medievalism is, is, is done yet. Perhaps someday I will leave my medieval hobbit hole um, and write a serious piece on Cormac McCarthy's medievalism, but I don't think that will be anytime soon. But so I hope this video gave a taste for just some of the medieval illusions throughout 
McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Um, and let me know what you think about this, what you think about um, sort of focusing on these medieval illusions, or if it's something that, that you've noticed and thought about at all. Um, I'd be really interested to continue this conversation. But for now, thanks for watching. Instead, I want to focus on three different instances.